All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, we do educational videos on this channel, uh, mostly highlighting great theories of everything, ancient and modern, from obscure sources, things that you can use to um, improve your physical, mental, and spiritual health, things that you can use for paradigm shifting, for awakening to 5D consciousness, for forming a holistic worldview. Today's the 40th video that we've done on Daniel Ingram and his book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. Um, Ingram has been meditating for a long time and he has meditated for many hours many, many hours in monasteries in, the, in Southeast Asia and has soaked it up from some monks who are connected with ancient traditions and has uh, kind of uh, geekishly uh, chronicled his experiences and his knowledge of the maps of consciousness, uh, particularly the maps of insight and concentration and is here to basically help you uh, use Buddhist meditation to wake yourself up, uh, to enlighten yourself and um, ultimately to eliminate suffering for yourself. He gives you the steps. You have to execute. Uh, very difficult. I have to execute. It's a very difficult task, but if you see it in front of you, then you're way more likely to um, make it happen. So uh, we are, I believe, in chapter 30, uh, which maybe 31, which has to do with uh, the uh, stages of insight and uh, insight meditation. So the practice, um, the three trainings of Buddhism are morality, concentration, and insight. So morality is just day-to-day -day being a good person. And then uh, concentration has to do with meditating on an object. And then insight has to do with meditating on your six sense doors, investigating for the three characteristics of those. And the three characteristics is actually the third of 16 um, stages of insight. And that's where we're at right now. We're in the middle of talking about the three characteristics. Uh, I might be going back half a paragraph here because I ran out of time last time and uh, not sure where I stopped off. But um, repetition is always, uh, not always, but... In these situations, it's usually beneficial. Okay, or start up right here. Even if these unpleasant physical manifestations do slack off for a bit, they are likely to recur until insight is sufficient to progress beyond this part of the stage of the three characteristics. Thus, we should find these meditation side effects interfering with our lives. Uh, I'm sorry, thus should we find these meditation side effects interfering with our lives, I recommend continued precise and accepting investigative practice. This is a phase of practice in which strong effort and very quick investigation pay off. Um, now, he was talking about uh, a lot of times in the three characteristics uh, stage, you develop a lot of physical pain. Uh, that's actually happened to me uh, I got uh, serious uh, jaw issues um, through um, some, you know, good meditation that I had been doing, and um, it went away eventually. So, you know, uh, it went away pretty quick, actually, but it was, uh, you know, I was, I haven't been to the doctor in you know, a very, very long time for anything health-wise. Uh, and uh, I was, you know, getting pressured to call the dentist, but eventually it got better. 
Okay. Um, certain traditions may look at such physical manifestations as energy imbalances or in some other negative light, and I can see where they're coming from, but I find those perceptives, uh, perspectives limiting. Rather, I see this stage in its broader context as just one more phase of practice. Others may spin very strange tales to explain these experiences. A friend of mine ran into this stage on retreat, found it very unpleasant, stopped practicing, and began to create all sorts of fantastic stories in her head about how the poor fellow sitting next to her was very angry and how it was making her tense. This didn't help whatsoever, and she got stuck there. Her practice derailed by obsession with a story she had just made up. I've learned to welcome these odd manifestations as clearly recognizable markers of progress on the path. They are clear objects for practice and reassure me that I am on the right track. Unfortunately, this lesson is hard to teach others. True, these manifestations are difficult, but being able to truly appreciate what is happening in the face of difficult stages is important and becomes much more important later. This stage can look like some similarly unpleasant later stages, the dark night stages described shortly, and it is easy to confuse this stage with those later stages. This stage tends to be more physically painful and involve more muscular pathology. But sorting out which is which is often more a question of timing, sequence, and context, as some of the emotional tones can be very similar. Bodily pains and tensions on one side more than the other naturally draw attention to that side. This is normal and understandable, but it can also cause problems. I highly recommend that you try to keep part of your attention focused on the other side of the body, even when one side hurts a lot more than the other side seems to, to disappear into the background in contrast, to be boring or to have nothing going on at all. Focusing too much meditative attention on one side of the body can cause all sorts of weird postural distortions and other odd meditative issues. Also, if one area hurts, it might be something on the other side or just above or below it that is causing the trouble. For example, plenty of TMJ problems, jaw pain, typically on one side, can be caused by the muscles on the other side of the head being too tight and throwing that joint off. Uh, interesting. But if you just focus on where the pain is most strongly sensed, you might easily miss what is causing it, as the side with the tense muscles often doesn't hurt. The back and neck are similar. You can have tension on one side that causes the other side to hurt. In short, whenever you have what seems to be isolated pain, check the other side and the surrounding areas to see if maybe there isn't something subtler but related going on, as that can help. This lesson took me a long time to learn, so hopefully passing it on will save some time for you. Noticing anything subtly fluxing, vibrating, or changing about the pain and the surrounding areas can also help to loosen it up and move it. As the mind gains speed at seeing each of the sensations of the mind and body come and go, the jerkiness from cause and effect can become very quick and pronounced. These physical movements and spasms seem to help break up the physical tension that may sometimes accompany this stage and are a sign of progress and should be allowed if possible. If you are on retreat and start shaking, talk with the teacher and see if there is a place where you can sit and shake as much as you need to. Dealing with this stage's sometimes strange physical effects can be troubling enough without having to deal with the reactions of everyone around you. I recommend neither cultivating the shaking nor restraining it 
unless you need to keep from hurting yourself, as some of the movements can get pretty weird. Kriyas can be fascinating for some people for a while, like some odd spasmodic badge of accomplishment, but they are just low-level, early-stage beginner stuff most of the time, though they can occasionally happen to more advanced meditators, and so shouldn't be any source of pride. As you will see, there is much to perceive beyond them. Being all excited and proud about having body spasms is sort of like being all excited and proud about being in the second grade. <laughs> Chapter 9, <laughs> In a Path with Heart, by Jack Cornfield, is worth reading about various odd effects that can occur and for skillful advice on how to deal with them. There's a great set of techniques explained in Robert Harry Hubbard's classic, How to Direct the Life Force to Dispel Mild Aches and Pains, that I recommend for this stage in particular. Though the knowledge contained therein has many other applications. As that older book is hard to find, you can check out his memorably titled newer book called Internal Moving healing manual of instruction, stopping your pain and other unpleasant things. Regardless, as meditation begins to take on a life of its own, we enter the second Vipassana jhana. Hey, remember there are four jhanas, four Vipassana jhanas, um, uh, for 16 different stages. Okay, so uh, we're going to be moving to the fourth stage, which is the beginning of the second jhana. So number four is called the arising and passing away. The fourth insight stage called the arising and passing away is also the beginning of the second vipassana jhana. As in the second shamatha jhana, uh, for concentration practices, the applied and sustained effort of attention begin to drop away, and meditation seems to take on a life of its own. As this is the second jhana, which has the basic attentional phase quality of having maximum clarity at the center of attention. This stage is noted for perceiving things clearly wherever the attention is directed. In fact, this is the stage where clarity of what is going on in the center of attention is greatest. This focused way of working in which you direct attention and perceive whatever is there very easily is understandably compelling and forms the basis of the stage. It also reinforces this way of relating to the meditation object, which is okay to a point, and in fact amazing to a point, but it can limit practitioners if they continue to try to apply the same attentional strategy and paradigm at later stages, as will be discussed when I get to the third Vipassana jhana. Keep that in mind so you can compare this stage and attentional mode to later ones. An overall general point about this stage is that it tends to be very impressive. When people say to me, I had this big experience, 99% of the time it is almost certainly related to the arising and passing away or the ANP. The descriptions I give of it may not line up exactly with how it happens or happened to you, but or for you, but pay attention to the general aspects of the pattern as you will notice many elements described here that you won't see described elsewhere. I tend to describe the ANP as it happens on retreat and with strong practice, but it can happen off retreat in daily life, spontaneously, without warning, in people who don't think of themselves as meditators, 
and even in dreams and to young children. Why some people seemingly spontaneously get into this territory early in life with no meditative training and some people who have done decades of meditation practice never get to this stage, I have no idea. There can be an extremely broad range of variability in the ANP and so it is not possible to match perfectly everyone else's description of it to what happens or what happened to you. For example, timing can vary widely. It can go on for seconds or months. Intensity can vary widely. It can occasionally be subtle, but the general trend is it for, for it to be very intense, high definition, and dramatic. The ANP works the same way functionally in terms of insight and of moving practice along, regardless of intensity and duration. So don't worry about these factors, those factors. Just to make this point clear, I will give two brief examples from my own practice. One time my entire body and world seemed to explode like a fireworks display in a powerful lucid dream with my whole sensate world zipping around like fragmented sparks through space for a while until things settled down. Another time I had a small second long zap of lightning fast energy through the back of my head while lying down on a couch in daily life, which was the whole of that AMP. My longest AMP phase was about three days of powerful shaking, sniffing, and energy craziness during a retreat. But I know people whose AMP stages lasted at the longest for a month or two. For those who are practicing meditation, as opposed to experiencing an occurrence in daily life, in the early part of this stage, the meditator's mind accelerates more and more, and reality begins to be perceived as particles or fine vibrations of mind and matter, each arising and vanishing utterly at tremendous speed. The traditional texts call this stage the beginning of insight practice. As from this point on, there is a much more direct and non-conceptual understanding of the three characteristics. This can be confounding with respect to the numbering schemes, as some, such as the Visuddha Maga, will label, label this stage as insight stage one, whereas I number it insight stage four. As long as you know which numbering scheme is being used in a given context, this should cause no problems. The stage is marked by dramatically increased perceptual abilities when compared with the previous stages. For example, we might be able to hone our awareness to laser-like precision on the tip of our little finger and seemingly be able to perceive the beginning and ending of every single sensation that make up that finger. Remember the exercise of the two fingers? Those in this stage can rock that practice like nobody else, even beyond those at higher stages of meditation. Spontaneous physical movements and strange jerky breathing patterns that showed up in cause and effect and became more pronounced in the three characteristics may speed up significantly. This stage explains where many practices such as Tibetan inner heat practices, Dumo, uh, come from, as a lot of heat and energy can be generated. Sweating is common for those who are having a lot of heat arise. This stage can also reveal the source material that inspired teaching systems involving the chakras, energy channels, and auras. Many, nay nearly all descriptions of Kundalini awakening are talking about this stage. Reality may be perceived directly with great clarity, great bliss, rapture, equanimity, mindfulness, concentration, and other po positive qualities arise. Practice is extremely profound and sustainable, and there may be no pain even after hours of sitting. Unfortunately, 
the positive qualities that have arisen can easily become what are called the ten corruptions of insight. If the true natures of the individual sensations by which they are known are not realized as well, and until this happens, a meditator can easily get stuck in the immature part of the stage. The trap is that these are all positive qualities, and in this stage they may show up with surprising intensity, much to most meditators' delight. It is understandable that people would not investigate these positive qualities, those positive qualities too clearly, and instead back off the investigation to bask in them, regardless of how conscious this backing off is. However, lack of investigation can convert positive meditation factors into more golden chains. The ten corruptions of insight are illumination, knowledge, rapturous happiness, tranquility, bliss, resolute confidence, exertion, assurance, equanimity, and attachment. To quote the great meditation teacher Sayadaw U. Pandita's excellent book on the path to freedom, as for the practicing yogi, he will at once recognize the above as imperfections of insight, not representing dhamma, breakthrough, and are only to be noted off. Remembering the teacher's advice as to what is path and not path. Being disabled by the ten imperfections, he would not be capable of observing the triple characteristics in their true nature. But once freed from imperfections, he is able to do so. In short, we might feel we are a very mighty meditator and that we should try to hold on to these qualities of experience forever. That is, we stop doing insight practices and instead solidify these pleasant qualities as concentration practice objects. Thus, the advice given about deconstructing and investigating the positive factors of the Shamatha Jhanas, particularly the second one, is also very helpful when trying to stay on the narrow path of the progress of insight. Though in truth, and as noted before, basically everyone alternates to some degree from insight territory to concentration territory and back, even if they are trying to stay to one side or the other, this is normal. Visions, unusual sensory abilities such as seeing nearby things through closed eyelids, and out-of-body experiences are common. Bright lights tend to arise for the meditator, sometimes first as a jewel tone sparkles, and then as a bright white light. I have seen the light. Some people will have the light persist and grow very bright and steady. Just note it or notice every moment of its apparent steadiness, and it will eventually break up and go away. Experiences of other powers are also common here, with the list being too long to go into, and this is the most spontaneous powers-prone stage of them all. I discuss the powers later and give plenty of advice about them, but just keep in mind that this stage is one source of many of those experiences. At points I personally could tell what I was about to that I was about to enter A&P territory in daily life as I would suddenly find myself reviewing my old magical references or buying new ones. Meditation in dreams and lucid dreaming is common in this territory. The need for sleep may be greatly reduced. People often don't recognize the A&P when it happens in dreams because lots of weird stuff happens in dreams. This stage is a common one, a common time for first time hyper lucid dreaming and out of body experiences, what I generally refer to as traveling. Or for those who have done that before, this stage makes it 
more, much more likely to occur. As with a sudden interest in magic, it is also a common time for people to become highly interested in lucid dreaming and out of body traveling, a topic I cover in bodies in part six. Skilled technical, me technical meditators, which make up only a small pr proportion of those who cross this, may sit easily for hours dissecting their reality into fine and fast sensations and vibrations, perhaps even up to 40 per second or more, with an extremely high level of precision and consistency, where the absurd and disheartening rumors of billions of mind moments per second come from is beyond me. Fine vibrations, chills, and tingles may spread over the body, revealing interference patterns between experiences in the style of more patterns. us, more patterns enabling us to know directly that when one sensation is experienced, in that instance, in, the, in that instant, something else is not. It is very easy to confuse this stage with descriptions of stage 11, equanimity, especially since the stage before it, re-observation, has some distinct similarities to stage three, the three characteristics. A brief discussion of the fractal nature of insight stages and concentration states will follow in a chapter called the Vipassana Jhanas. The big difference between the arising and passing and equanimity is that this stage is generally ruled by quick cycles, quickly changing frequencies of vibrations, odd physical movements with uh, strange breathing patterns, heady raptures, a decreased need for sleep, strong bliss, and a general sense of riding on a spiritual roller coaster with no brakes. The higher stages, 10 and 11, do not have those qualities. As to the cycles, they tend to proceed as follows. With this description, assuming you are using the breath as object, the mind kicks in, follows faster and faster vibrations, attention engages and speeds up, perhaps accompanied by more pronounced shaking or strange breathing patterns increasing in speed. Finally, halfway down an out breath, there is a shift our mind may drop down slowly with the breath. It takes work to stay with sensations as they slow down and then the breath and attention bottom out. The breath may stop entirely for a while. Then the mind may come back, uh, may come back up with the breath. Attention tends to flag. Things relax and then the cycle begins again with investigation speeding up. These breathing cycles may happen on their own and may even be difficult to stop when we are deeply into the stage. Those using visualizations as objects may notice that the objects begin to spin with the, fra with the phase of the breath or move in ways that suggest they have a life of their own, albeit a largely two-dimensional one, as compared to the more strongly three-dimensional visions that may arise in later stages, though three-dimensional visions can occasionally also arise here, just to make things confusing. As this stage deepens and matures, Meditators let go of even the high levels of clarity and the other strong factors of med meditation, perceiving even these to arise and pass as just fluxing sensations and or vibrations to not satisfy and not to be self. Some will notice the slow variant of the arising and passing and may plunge down into the very depths of the mind 
as though plunging deeply underwater to where they can perceive individual frames of reality arise and pass with breathtaking clarity as though in slow motion. It can even feel as if we have been partially sedated with a strong opiate-like drug and submerged in thick syrup. At the bottom of these depths, however, they present themselves individual moments may sometimes have a frozen quality to them, like garish snapshots of the bottom of a well, as if sensations were stopping completely in the middle of their manifestation for just an instant. And this way of experiencing reality is unique to the stage. Somewhere in there is the entrance to the third Vipassana jhana in Upandita's model. Though there is some controversy about exactly which insights line up with which Vipassana jhanas from here on out. I prefer to think of the arising and passing away as being purely second Vipassana jhana. Since the ANP is known for its speed and sensate perception, its slow variant way of manifesting may confuse some into not realizing it was the ANP, but functionally it works the same way and leads to the same results, which raises an interesting question. All are variants of the ANP functionally the same? I would say yes, in that they all lead to the next stages. However, some variants will obviously lead to other real-world world effects owing to the specifics of the possibly dramatic presentations and people's reaction to them. Okay, we're going to stop right there for today. And uh, we'll start up uh, right where we left off tomorrow. Uh, right in the middle of this section on the arising and passing away in the insight stages of Daniel Ingram's book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. Thanks for tuning in today and have a wonderful day.